I think I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, there will probably be a few more people coming in. I have a lot that I want to cover, and I want to have time for you to have um, some conversations with each other. Uh, if you end up finding yourself at a table by yourself, at some point you want to go back and, and join others, but we'll I'll encourage people to, as they come in to, to come up and come toward the front. front. Um, I'd first like to start, first of all, I'm David Dickinson. Uh, from Vanderbilt University and delighted to be a part of this gathering. I was up in that room first thing this morning as an impressive number of educators who've gathered together for two days. Uh, it's really exciting to see the energy. Um, I, I, before I get going, I'd like to find out a sense of who you are because since this is uh, focusing on early childhood, I know it's not likely to be the bulk of the people at this organization, at this meeting, probably not focusing on early childhood. So I'm kind of curious to get a sense of the mix of people who are in the room. So um, how many of you dealing with um, the age, infant to uh, school entry? All right, a number of you are. Now I'm curious, I know the Striving Readers Grant has funding for that. Can just what, what is it that you're doing in that area? Because I think that that's an exciting aspect of this grant, that it does include children prior to school. So what, what are the sort of things that you're doing? I'm just curious. You, you raised your hand, right? I did. I'm um, not working with the grant specifically, Here. but I I'm with the SST um, down in the southeastern part of the state, and I do the early learning and school readiness. Um, I'm a consultant. Okay. Any, anybody who's working with a grant through the, the funding? Yeah. I just want to help advertise this, this aspect of the project. Uh, for our birth to three families, um, we have kind of, it's a two-part um, series that we're doing where the parents come and learn how to work with their child, read to their children. We demonstrate reading and we give them books. And, and then there are activities for the children while the parents are then in a book club where they're given a book, they choose a book to read and then they come back and discuss um, the book themselves so that they model reading for the children. And this is funded through the Striving through Readers? The grant, right. Yeah. And then our preschool, um, we have been doing lots of um, book studies and training and we also in, implemented the STAR program so that um, all teachers are doing the same kinds of things. Cool. Right. Any, anybody else doing anything in the early childhood years here? That, yeah, here, just here. Uh, we have children birth through five, and we are implementing the Read It Again curriculum, which focuses on uh, narrative, phonological awareness, um, print knowledge, and One other, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and so then in addition to that, there's a mobile app for that. So there's oh, some okay. technology involved. And then um, I authored the, we created a curriculum for infants and toddlers, which is a modified version of that curriculum. Okay, cool, well, good, all right. Thank you. So um, there's a few different things that are happening. And what I'm gonna be talking about, um, hopefully will have relevance to early childhood, teachers, administrators, um, and uh, people who are in kindergarten, first grade. Um, my hope is that you can see ways to apply the things that I talk about to the, the settings that you're working with. So what I'm going to be um, talking about today will be taking a, a holistic perspective to child and children's development um, with a particular focus on the role of language. Uh, in children's um, development. So, let's, oh, we've got to turn this one on, then it'll work. So, I uh, hope that everybody in this room has had an occasion in your life when uh, a new baby has come into your life, either your own child, a niece, a nephew, a neighbor, um, and when that, ha that wonderful event happens, um, we all have hopes for what's going to, uh, what that child is going to grow into, what, what the future holds for that child. And they maybe take different forms. Um, we have different kinds of dreams for children. We have multiple dreams for children. Um, so I'm curious, you think about one set of hopes often has to do with the emotional development of your child. Um, you want to have that child form a strong bond with you. 
Um, I know that's a core issue for all parents. Um, and connected with that is you want to have your child develop into having close friendships that are when they're young and as they grow up. Of course, friends are one of the most important things as children go through the elementary schools, particularly in middle school and beyond. They kind of make it, make it or break it for children's happiness in life. Um, and then, of course, there are the academic um, outcomes that we're hoping for. We're here at a Striving Readers Conference. We want to have children learn to read. Um, we want them, of course, to learn how to read because that's tied in with academic success. You know that third grade, uh, the reading levels of children when they're in third and fourth grade are predictive of whether they graduate or not. Uh, children who are um, well below the basic level expected for, for graduation in third grade are at greatly increased risk of dropping out, especially if they're from poor backgrounds. Um, so there's a huge need to have a really laser-like focus on early reading success. Connected with um, early reading success, I'm going to be talking about one of these core capacities uh, uh, that uh, develops in children that's part of this whole child development, which is their ability to regulate their own attention, self-regulation. Another term for that um, is executive function, and I likely will go back and forth um, between those two terms. Now, the argument I'm going to make through this entire talk is that these capacities, which I'm sure we could all agree, of course, we all want to have those for our children. Um, I'm going to argue that these actually multiple different kinds of developmental outcomes can be traced back to a very basic set of interaction and competencies that have to do with language, um, and conversations that you can have with your children, uh, parents and children, teachers, teachers and students. Um, in the opening session today, you heard about uh, the importance of teaching and teaching and teaching, especially in the early childhood years. Um, I will argue that it's conversations. Um, teaching um, is one aspect of how you interact with children, um, but at least with young children, uh, there's also just the forming of a connection through stories, through, connect, through conversations um, that is really powerful. So the, the responsive conversations linked also, of course, with skillful teaching. Um, sometimes in the preschool years, the teaching elements of what you do in a classroom um, have not been as well articulated. I think that's changing um, over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, but certainly, teaching, I think, has to be done in the early childhood years with a particular deft quality of attention to how you provide learning experiences in ways that still honors the, the fact that children are very young and they uh, want to be engaged in play and they're not necessarily going to be sitting and be sort of uh, studious uh, young, young children. And um, one of the core activities that can occur anywhere and that the, the world has heard plenty about um, is book reading. And book reading is potent um, because it's such a rich context for having the kinds of conversations that are really powerful. So <clears throat> one of the core competencies that children develop uh, starting at birth um, is attachment. And if any of you have had any developmental psychology or been around, you can hardly not know about the, the notion that um, we come into this world as humans, as primates, primed to form a relationship with primary caretakers. Um, and when all goes well, that results in a secure relationship that uh, confers uh, the ability for uh, dealing with anxiety, um, and it allows us to go out and explore the world. Children who have formed an early attachment are able to take on risks, to take on challenges. Children, on the other hand, who haven't had the opportunity to form that kind of relationship tend to be anxious. They tend to be avoidant. They're not the ones that are bold to step forward. That anxiety can take, take the role, the, the form in a, as a young children, not going out and exploring with objects, but as you grow older, it can be not going out and exploring the world, the ideas of, uh, and taking risks um, with learning things and in, in school. So children who lack a secure attachment 
They don't engage in much exploration. Um, they don't sort of respond much. And they're this classic way of studying this is to look what happens when a mother comes back after she's been out of a room. The children may not re respond, may not react to the, to the fact that the mother has been away. They may be avoidant. So there are, very, there are classic patterns that psychologists have used to discover this. But we can see the, the lingering effects um, for, for many years um, because there have now been starting when we first became aware of this really in the 60s and the 70s, so there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies looking at this attachment relationship. Um, and what has, what's been found through these uh, compiling the results of hundreds of these studies um, is that um, the early form of attachment that happens in the first two or three years um, is, has long-term effects. Um, you're more, if you have a for secure attachment, you're less likely to be depressed, um, fearful, or withdrawn um, over the years, and you're more likely to have good relationships with peers. Um, and this is, even though you could measure it at an early childhood years, you could measure it in, um, even up to age 22. Uh, children who had been, their attachment relationships were measured early on. So this is, so most of you are not dealing with mothers at the first six months of life. However, the attachment relationships are formed and sustained throughout the, the early preschool years. So this is, this is not something that's uh, like a completely done deed, but it certainly is being formulated in the early, early school years. And <clears throat> I encourage, though, to the extent that this grant is working with families of, of very young children, that the parents are getting messages about how they should relate to and nurture their very young children. So I'm going to have a number of things in my presentation today um, that are going to be addressed to parents of young children, even though they may not be in the programs you're serving, I would hope in your communities you could connect with programs that are offering these kinds of supports to families. Um, because one element of development that absolutely has long-term consequences for children is this attachment relationship. <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, now to turn to language. So how do you form a relationship, uh, an attachment relationship? One of the important features of it is the language. Um, language development, children's speed of, of acquiring language and the richness of their language um, is related to their, uh, to their attachment, the quality of their attachment. Um, for many years, the people who studied attachment were very focused on the sensitivity and lovingness of the relationships. But in the, like 10, 15 years ago, it began to become clear. It wasn't just how loving and, and attentive you were. It's also the in, infusing that relationship with, with, with talk. Um, and the conversations are a part of that forming of that bond. Um, securely attached children at, fifth, at age of 15 months, a child is securely attached. They're likely to have stronger language at age 36 months. And as we go through my talk, you're going to see having thir stronger language at 36 months is going to have relationship to your language abilities in, in kindergarten, which is going to be predictive of third grade, which is going to be predictive of high school uh, graduation. These things are all, inter all interconnected in a, in a chain that goes all the way from the earliest preschool years through high school. So if we want to have children um, graduating from high school, we really need to take attention, may, uh, be attentive to these early childhood years. And um, I am argue that the quality of interactions are, that include language are one very important pillar uh, of that early development. <clears throat> Another finding um, that's well established now is that there's a relationship between attachment and book reading. Now, when that, that work first came out, the people were coming from the attachment perspective, and they said, oh, look at that. Children who are better attached are more likely to engage in book reading. They get along. They have more episodes of book reading. They, they're more harmonious book reading. But when I talked with those researchers, they said, well, you know, it's correlational. It could be that as you engage in more book reading, if, those, if that's a harmonious relationship, that the book reading activities with parents is also building attachment. So it, it, I'm, I, it's pretty likely that it goes both ways. Um, children who are easy to be with, who are uh, well attached, are, are, are enjoyable uh, to, to interact with. But as you interact with them, you're building their language, and the language is supporting the, the, um, the attachment development. Um, so there's a likely a, a spiral, a positive spiral, as, as both of these are developing together. 
So what is important, those of you who have access to working in the communities, to trying to galvanize communities in supporting the development of young children, um, is that you, you find ways to communicate with parents and support organizations that are doing these kinds of things, um, building relationships with the programs that deliver services to families um, that may need special support. Um, now, I have a couple, this, um, I don't have handouts on your table, but the website uh, has my uh, talk. But I'll just show you that there are some proven strategy programs um, that have been delivering these kinds of services. And I know that's not a standard school system, but they're work that's been done through um, the University of Texas, uh, th through, through Texas and uh, Play and Learning Strategies, the Children's Learning Institute, um, has programs that are um, proven to be able to help parents uh, interact with their children through coaching strategies. And they have a number of different um, training kinds of materials that are available. You can't, you can't go through and read this right now, but I just want to bring your attention to the, the Play and Learning Strategies. Um, now, a very uh, exciting development um, that's been coming along, I would say, for the last 10 or 15 years um, is to use pediatric clinics as a way to reach parents. Um, you know, the, the problem in the early childhood years is, is everything is so fragmented. We, have, we don't have centralized support for children across communities. Um, schools may work with inter early intervention with children that have been identified with special problems, um, but we've got various support agencies. But all children are going to the doctor, and hopefully they're having support to go there, and, and, and they go for well child visits. And so at those well baby visits, there are now projects that are being developed and delivered in some locations to support parents around the kinds of things that I'm talking about, how to engage in the sort of interactions with children that are going to be supportive of these early developments that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and one very interesting one has been developed in, um, in New York. Uh, it's called the Video Interaction Project. Um, and they have, uh, right now, um, in the Brooklyn area, they're starting to have uh, universal service. So the parents that come into the clinics are meeting with, uh, with people who uh, will coach them in interacting with their children. They videotape them. They give feedback to the parents around how they're interacting with their children and, and supporting them in reinforcing their, uh, the positive things um, that they're doing with the children. So they, they actually are also linked in with the libraries, which is the, the kind of direction that I really would hope that we could be moving as a society is that these services that are available for families begin to connect with each other and be mutually reinforcing. Um, there's another project closer to here uh, that's based in the University of Chicago called the 30 Million Word Project. Um, and they are also um, creating services where they go and they work in the communities, um, they have support, they have training avail uh, materials available online for working with parents and communities, and they're looking to work with various communities. I think they're starting in Illinois, but if there was uh, some sort of a go-getter community here, uh, they might be able to work with you. So um, there are organizations that are trying to um, move this whole effort into more systematic delivery to um, families. So I started with attachment because that's the uh, aspect of development that is well known, has been, been around for many years. Um, another aspect of development we have likely have heard about um, over the last few years um, is self-regulation, um, or also it's referred to as executive function. Now self-regulation um, takes two forms. Um, there's a if you've heard about the way psychologists study self-regulation, it's a little bit diabolical. Um, they, one way is to look at how well children are able to resist impulses, things that they want to do. This is sometimes called um, hot uh, uh, cognitive control. So one thing they'll do is they will, uh, this is a classic little uh, marshmallow task. They'll, they'll, they'll put a marshmallow in front of a child and they'll say, okay, I'm gonna leave the room and, if, and I'm gonna go be gone for two or three minutes. When I come back, if you haven't eaten that marshmallow, you can have three marshmallows. 
So you look and see. Children who don't eat that marshmallow uh, get rewarded, um, and they're also ones then who are judged to have better ability to, to regulate their attention. They do other things like, uh, oh, turn your back, I'm going to wrap a present here, and don't turn, don't peek, don't peek, and then they put the present in front of the child, say I'm going to leave the room, the same kind of thing. Can they resist the urge to tear that package open? Um, so there are, there are other kinds of tasks like that are this uh, can they resist the impu impulses? And this would be the kind of thing that a teacher would see in a classroom. Don't shout out, wait, raise your hand, you know, that sort of controlling, controlling behavior. Now, there's another kind of element where they've discovered that, that children aren't necessarily the same in their ability to regulate themselves. There's cognitive regulation. This is cool self, right? cool control, cool, cool cognitive control. Um, and, and this is um, the kind of capacity that you see with the child who can sit in the blocks area and work for 15 or 20 minutes and pile one block very carefully on the next, or who's threading beads on a string, or doing something that requires very focused attention. Um, and the way they do, um, they, they, they test that um, is with a, a, a sort of a Simon Says type task. So uh, I'm going to just, you all got a chance to walk down the elevator. Now, um, I'm going to just try this a little bit. Will you see if you can do this? Okay. Um, all right. Um, I want you to uh, put your, you, do what I tell you, okay? I'm gonna, we're going to do what I tell you and not what I show you. Uh, but sometimes they'll go together. So put your hands on your head. Put your hands on your shoulders. Put your hands on your stomach. Put your hands on your head. Put your hands on your shoulders. Put your hands on your head. Put your hands on your shoulders. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you did what I said, not what I did. The children's ability to, to attend to the verbal directions rather than the shown directions um, is just one of these um, tasks that actually has proved to be um, a pretty good one for measuring a, this other, this cool cognitive control. Um, and language ability is connected with both of these. Children who are developing language earlier at 18 months, 24 months, are more likely to be dem demonstrating the capacity for self-regulation of, of both, both of these types. Um, and it turns out that that cool cognitive control, the ability to listen to words and, and keep the words in mind and, and to keep a focus on a, a sort of a, a cognitively challenging task, um, is the one that has the best prediction. Uh, one, one researcher, um, Greg Duncan and, and colleagues, pulled together data from 36,000 children. They pulled different, different data sets and put them together and found that this self-regulation capacity or executive functioning was predictive of children's uh, later academic um, reading and math and, um, scores. Um, and that finding and others has made it so that everybody is really interested now um, in executive functioning. As I said, cool, cool EF is particularly important. Now, the important thing around my message around language is these are bidirectional. It's not just that you learn how to control your behavior, but you also learn your learning language. And studies that have looked at children's development during the preschool years find that the children who have Better executive functioning early on learn language more quickly, and children who develop language learn executive functioning more quickly. Uh, they, they acquire executive functioning better. Um, and, and this improvement um, is, is seen throughout the elementary school years. Now, you begin to see these acquiring these abilities in the very earliest childhood years. Um, if you have Ha if you have a child or you have neighbor's friends who are very young, you'll notice sometimes that there'll be gesturing early on in the first, first months before children are talking. They'll be pointing at things or parents will, will point at things. Interestingly, that's a harbinger of language development. It turns out the children who are doing more pointing at 10 months, 12 months, strong develop language faster. And the children who are developing that, the pointing gestures and language end up having stronger uh, executive functioning. So these, they're very early on, the seeds of this development are being sown. And parents who are responding to children's gestures are, are fostering children's development. Um, you see this among Head Start children in the preschool years. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these studies, but the, um, the, the, the take-home message is it's clear that during the preschool years, 
children are acquiring language, they're being supported to acquire language in a way that is reciprocal between the self-regulatory capacities and, um, and their ability to regulate their own behavior. So now, I'm going to stop talking for a minute and, and let the best teacher um, who, is a, who is a parent um, show you what this looks like. And um, I'm going to show this video, uh, and then I'm going to ask you to spend a couple of minutes talking with, with somebody near you. And um, see what you can find. I, have, I haven't gone through all of the specific behaviors that are related to development, but, but you're going to see Tanya doing all of them in about, 18, uh, about a minute and a half uh, here. It's, you know, it's a remarkable how much good stuff can happen in a short period of time. So um, Tanya here um, is reading with her daughter Eliza. Uh, Eliza was being raised um, bilingually. Uh, Tanya herself was fluent in Spanish, although the interaction is mostly in, in English, but you'll hear a little, little element of, of Spanish um, inserted. Uh, and at this point, uh, Eliza was 18 months old. So I'm going to show you this book reading, uh, and I want you to just be noticing the things that seem to you to be really positive. I haven't gone through the details of the self-regulation and attachment, but I suspect that together we will generate most of the kinds of supportive behaviors that are what you want to see have happening um, that, that fosters the development of both self-regulation and attachment. Okay. Oh, ready? Daddy. <gasps> oh, okay. The title? Yeah. yeah, it's a niño. It's eggs, eggs. That's the title. Ow. Eggs. <laughs> Is that a flower? Yeah, look at him. He looks like he's looking for eggs. Eggs. Egg. Mm -hmm. It does look like a ball, doesn't it? It's an egg, though. Ba. Should we start? Hooray, it's Easter, a day of fun. There are eggs to find for everyone. Let's grab our baskets. Ready, set, go. Search here, search there, search high and low. Look at there's niños, and they're looking for eggs. Uh -huh. Remember, you and Henry looked for eggs, and you put them in your basket on Easter? Basket, look. But are there any eggs? No eggs. Okay. Should we turn the page? And turn the page? Good girl. Oh, hold on. Should we skip the page? There we go. Molly's first stop is the flower bed. Mommy's spring roses are yellow and red. Yellow and red roses. She's okay. looking. Are they behind the roses? Let's look. <gasps> Yay! Molly found the first eggs. They're shiny and blue. Now Pete and Kate have some hunting to do. Where is she going to put her eggs? Look, she found how many? One, two, three, four, five. She's going to put them in her basket, I bet. She found them behind the roses. Good job, Molly. Roses, flower. Want to smell it? Pretty? Should I smell? Should I smell it? They're pretty. Mmm, pretty. Let's pretend they smell. Okay. okay. Talk with uh, somebody near you and, and come up with a few things, behaviors that you think are particularly likely to be supportive of, uh, of Eliza's development here.
Okay, I'm hearing a number of ideas being shared. Um, so let's pull together. I suspect there'll be some different ideas coming from different places. Um, and just as an in information, the guy with the camera here uh, is shooting you up close and personal because these are uh, this session and all the other sessions are going to be put on the on the web uh, to be shared with those who couldn't be here. So there, they'll be editing a, a professional sort of video that uh, includes me, but it includes some of you and the and the presentations. That'll be made uh, more widely available. Um, okay, so. Um, Let's, I'm going to go back. I'm going to start at the back of the room here. I'd say one, one or two observations from back here, something that you noticed. Anybody here willing to, to speak into the microphones? Sure. Um, we talked about just those beginning concepts of print that she was already exposing her to, um, turning the page and calling attention to things within the book, knowing the title. And also, we were just really amazed by her ability, the little girl's ability to sit and really be attending to the task at hand. OK. Yeah, certainly there's this early beginnings of understanding about uh, not only print, but how books work, you know, the front to back. Um, and they're holding the book right side up. So they're very, very fundamental uh, print concepts. But certainly, the attention uh, was, was really good. Anything else over here? Do you guys have anything? Yeah. Just liked how um, the mom uh, connected what they were reading to an activity that the daughter actually did when uh, searching for eggs. Right, that was powerful. Yeah, so there was a, a connection to their own experiences, which, for an 18-month-old um, to use language to connect to something that happened in the past, we have no idea whether she actually was able to do that or not. Um, but but it was being modeled, the fact that you could talk about um, something that happened in the past um, and connect it to the right now. Other other thoughts that people had across the different different tables here. So over here, anybody? I saw people talking over here. Somebody had, brave enough? Here. Well, there was a lot of reciprocal uh, language where whatever the child would say, the mom would validate or would extend her language. So there was a lot of things happening just with language that actually wasn't in the book. That's right. And, and the term that is used in attachment literature for that reciprocal language is responsiveness. Um, the mother was remarkably responsive. And, and while some of you may not be um, dealing with uh, early childhood teachers, um, I can tell you that that capacity to listen to and respond to what children are saying is a, one of the most potent tools for teaching that teachers have. We see it here with 18 a month old, but it's equally powerful with a first grader, a fourth grader, a high school student, um, that, that developing a dialogic uh, interaction. I, I, I heard um, uh, Dr. Archer talking about how you don't want to have it be me, 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 but you want to have it a reciprocal back and forth. Um, and, and the roots of that lie, um, and it, it's, it pays benefit, dividends from the beginning of life, really. You'll see a mother interacting with a, a six-month-old or, or a father or a grandfather going back and forth. The child may not be um, uh, talking. I actually have a, a video of my, my daughter interacting with her two week old and the baby will open his eyes and she talks back and forth. So that reciprocity is, is built into us as humans and we definitely want to be able to build on that when we're interacting with, um, with uh, children. And it has this very powerful, um, simple, built into us, but incredibly powerful. Other, other things that people notice that haven't been mentioned so far. I noticed that she was very patient and was going at a pace that the child was going at and asking permission to turn the page. Are you ready now? Can we turn the page now rather than just rushing through it? Right. That was, um, that was, she's just so calm and poised. And so by being patient, that means Eliza is leading the activity. 
Uh, it's, now, there, there's a, at a point, there was a little bit of direction, so well, now, now shall we move on? But it wasn't a push, push, push. Um, and, and if you think about taking that into school context, and we have problems sometimes where um, the curriculum is, is, is pushing people along faster than maybe children, especially young children, are able to take things in. Um, but certainly in the interaction between a mother and a very young child, that patient listening and, and following and reinforcing, uh, the, Eliza couldn't do anything wrong. You know, everything that Liza did um, was validated. That's another thing that was completely validating um, rea um, interactions. Any, any other observations that have, yeah, you want to just? Right. 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 It, it wasn't a, okay, now we're going to read a book and you sit and listen to me and we're going to get through this book, you know, none of this talk stuff. We want to finish the book. No, it, it was definitely a reciprocal kind of a thing. And you, and you notice how um, remarkably um, attuned they were. And, and what amazing language lessons. So, so Eliza would say the word, uh, her version of egg, and Tanya would immediately repeat it but with, a, with adult pronunciation. So that's one of the most potent teaching mechanisms that we have. Um, actually, that's another one that goes across the years. You, you listen, college, university professors will do that. Somebody puts an idea out, and it's just sort of a little bit off, off the mark, and you'll back and say, yeah, that's right, and then they'll rephrase it, and it'll be just a little bit better attuned, or teachers will do that same kind of thing. You want to validate and gently sort of shape and, and correct things um, in ways that are modeling um, the sort of adult behavior. One more observation. Anybody have something we haven't mentioned yet? OK, well, uh, you've, you've hit on many of the things that I wanted to bring out. Um, Something that wasn't mentioned, um, but also has uh, interesting implications for um, classrooms, um, I think, at all ages, but certainly early childhood um, classrooms, uh, is having predictable routines. You notice that that activity, uh, Eliza sat down, she knew exactly what was going to happen. Um, that couch, that, that cushion, that pillow has been used on many occasions. It was a predictable routine, and, and predictability gives children a sense of control. Um, you know, we, we all hate it when things are like, we can't know what's happening. I don't know when my airplane's leaving. Is it going to be canceled? Um, is it going to be one of those max 8, 7, 7, 7, you know, <laughs> if you don't have control over things, it's very unsettling. And so this predictable routine um, gave um, Eliza certainty about what's happening. They can settle right into it. As you pointed out, Eliza was leading the, um, the interaction with Tanya following her. Um, and this was entirely a language rich, all the way through, Tanya was talking and using language. Wasn't talking at her, um, but she was using language. Um, and if you were to have a transcript of it, you'd see this fairly sophisticated language. She's not talking baby talk to her. Um, she's talking with her in a comprehensible way because it's supported by a familiar routine and by the book. Um, and, and Tanya is using language for lots of purposes. Now, sometimes people can get into what's this, what's that, what's this. But, but uh, Tanya is using it. She's labeling the eggs. She's the, yeah, that's what it is. But she's also talking about actions. She's talking about feelings, um, talking about past events. Um, and um, finally, it's fun. Uh, that's one of the things that sometimes we can have problems within schools. You know, th this is all playful. It's all engaging. It's not like, oh, yeah, uh, now it's time to sit down with mommy and have a lesson in, in book reading. Uh, we're not doing flashcards, I mean, though this is every bit as powerful as if parents um, were to try to do some of those things that have been sold in the past that are now not on the market. Um, but uh, this is a language. This is instructional, but this is instructional that was enjoyable and playful. Um, so. These are, these are behaviors that have been validated by behavioral sciences, uh, scientists um, in many studies. Responsivity, responses to verbal and nonverbal cues. That's one of the things you picked up right away. Um, so Eliza didn't have to say things, but, but Tanya was watching her and was responding to it. Sensitive, warm, and loving. Those, those are 
qualities that ever since people have begun to look at attachment have recognized that the mothers that are forming attachment relationships have this gentleness that we see Tanya um, uh, modeling. Um, something that's called mind reading uh, also seems to be uh, important. And mind reading is what just happens naturally is when you look at a six month old and it makes a, a frown and it furrows its brow, say, oh, baby's not unhappy. Oh, you, what, what's going on? You're surprised. That's reading the child's emotions, reading into what the child is thinking, and putting it into words. Um, that, that, that taking the child's internal life, feelings, and, and language, and, and stating it is, a, is, a capac is a, an activity that supports the development of, of self-regulation and attachment. Um, occur in, encouraging sustained attention. You, one of you mentioned how patient she was. Um, if we want to have children develop this uh, cool cognition, we need to give them the opportunity to be in control of things and, to, and to, to, to focus on things. So if you take that and you think about it in terms of classrooms, you know, you want to give children if they, enough period if they have a, a, an activity time when they're on their own, you don't want to have them jerping from one activity to the other in every five minutes. You want to let them get engaged and sustain their engagement in things. And finally, the interaction, as I've said, is wrapped in language. Tanya responds to what Eliza is saying. She talks for Eliza. She, she responds to Eliza. She talks about what's happening, and they talk about past and future. Now, just a little bit here, uh, research on how this works. So there's, there's um, people are increasingly um, talking about development where you, you see that there are multiple patterns for supporting this. Some called mediated, mediated effects. And, and this is a study that looked at with preschools and preschool children. And what they looked at is the beginning of the preschool years, and they measured children's executive functioning skills using those little, like, things like those little tests that I showed you. And then they looked at children's reading and math uh, development at the end of the year. Well, you would expect that executive functioning would be supporting the development of reading and math because children can, can attend in school. And, and indeed, that's the direct effect. That's the sort of straightforward. But they also suspected that children with better executive functioning would be able better to engage in learning experiences like book reading. So they went into the classroom and they observed children during book reading. What they found is the kids that had better executive function were listening to books better, and the children who were listening to books better um, were making progress in reading math. So it's just not that not only that you had better executive functions that led to this, but you had better executive functioning lets you engage in the classroom in more effective ways. And that engagement in the classroom builds your language and builds your capacities. So there's multiple ways that this is playing out. Of course, then you need to have engaging activity. So this is a this is says you, it's not just having executive functioning, but it's having classrooms in which those capacities can be exercised and developed um, supports development. Um, so implications for classrooms. Uh, provide children engaging activities that involve, now this is, this is research from people who did that previous slide that I just showed you. Um, they've gone into lots of classrooms and they found that certain kinds of things happen in classrooms where children are developing more quickly. And one of them is having multiple act activities with multiple steps, like blocks, dramatic play, book reading. Um, helping children in a state, I've already mentioned, predictable routines uh, and, and systems for behavior, um, you know, how you get to your centers, you take your little marker, your, your, your label or whatever, and you know when you're supposed to go and how you, what you do when you move between systems. Um, minimizing large group times, um, especially when those large group times are boring. Um, that's a, the predictable, that's a negative predictor um, of development. Um, helping children stay on task. And in those groups, uh, I found this in my own research, um, groups are not just, they're not only, they're not bad all the time. They're, 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 some of them is good. And while children are in those groups, um, there's, teachers can sometimes say, oh, Johnny, uh, look up here, or ask a kid, child whose attention is wandering a question. Those kind of quick, uh, they're teaching children to keep their attention. What's not so good, beneficial is, oh, now remember what the rules are here. We all should stop and do and raise your hand. That sort of plotting, um, badgering children for attention is much less effective um, because it just sort of takes them off and it creates a negative kind of environment. Um, sort of quick attention um, ma maintenance is useful. Um, helping children, okay, and providing activities that build language, lots of language activities. Now, 
If you're interested in more of these um, strategies for um, how to, uh, and, and workshop materials for how to, in, to support teachers in providing classrooms, um, these are the, what they call the magic eight. I was talking to this group that's been working actually out of Vanderbilt. Here are a list of different kinds of things. And they have um, materials that were developed in collaboration with preschool teachers in um, um, the Metropolitan and Nashville Public Schools. Um, they have a whole magic, uh, developmental series of workshops and slides and, and strategies for what teachers can do in their classroom. So if you're working on professional development, um, I would encourage you to, to take a look at this, um, these materials. They're, they're done with the uh, sort of practitioner eye since they were done developed in collaboration between researchers and teachers. Um, another resource for those of you interested in look, thinking about um, language in the early childhood years is the Atlanta Speech School. It's a very powerful um, organization that um, is doing outreach to programs, uh, especially programs that serve low-income children. And they now have free online professional development courses through something called their Cox Campus. Uh, they have an infant toddler series with three sessions, and they have a seven-session uh, seven um, series uh, for, for pre-K teachers, and just to see what that, that looks like. So these are, these are free, um, very well-developed uh, program um, courses here that have um, videos and guidance for, uh, here we have two and a half hours on the power of language, meaningful conversations, transforming story time. So there's some wonderful materials available. Um, so if you're working in your district or with your state, uh, I encourage you to take advantage of these things that have been developed by the Cox campus. They're, they're not, not making anything at all. They're not making a dime on this. They're just trying to help um, early childhood teachers and parents uh, be more successful in supporting their children's development. So there's one other element of development um, that's important in the early childhood years and continues, um, which is theory of mind. Um, and you actually may have occasions when you would hope that others around you would have a better theory of mind, which is better awareness that other people have perspectives uh, that are different from your own, uh, that they understand things that, um, that are different than yours, and, that just, and you have to get into other people's heads in order to understand things. So, um, and, and finally, something that's really important for children uh, for understanding um, literature is that, that people are governed by motivations. They do things for reasons. Um, and sometimes those reasons, you have to kind of figure out what they are. Actually, many, um, many of the best books for young children, the authors are doing in an artful kind of way. They don't say, oh, Peter was jealous, and so he didn't really like having a new baby in the house. They'll show Peter getting upset because his par parents are painting things pink or taking things away from him that he used to have, but he won't, won't kind of beat you over the head by saying Peter was, was upset and, and jealous. Um, and so in order to fully understand, to sort of enjoy the story, though, you need to intuit an, um, what's going on in Peter's minds and Peter's reaction to, to those events. Um, so it's a, a capacity that's this theory of mind is important for children's understanding of the stories. Um, so I'm going to show you another video here, and I'm going to ask you again to take a minute and think about um, what's, what is going, how Jana here is supporting her child and how theory of mind um, plays a role in, in understanding this story. Uh, it's a, a sweet little story called Minerva Louise, um, and you'll see it's about a chicken uh, who uh, is an adventurous soul, and it's a snowy day, as you've had a number of those this year, um, and she wants to go out exploring, and uh, you'll see her uh, sort of misadventures. But being a chicken, she's a little dumb, um, so she doesn't quite get things. So this book, right here, this is the, what is this part called when it tells the name of the book? Remember what that's called? It's the title. The title is A Hat for Minerva Louise by Janet Morgan Stokey. A hat for Minerva Louise. What do you notice about that picture? There's a snowman, a chicken, and a there's a snowman, a chicken, and a sheep. A chicken! A chicken? 
Look, there's the chicken again. A hat for Minerva Louise. Minerva Louise loved snowy mornings. What is Minerva Louise? Chicken. It's a chicken. Chicken. Her friends didn't like them one bit. They stayed inside all day with their heads tucked under their wings. Why do you think they want to tuck their heads under their wings? Because it's cold. Ooh, it's cold outside. It's all snowy. And they just want to stay inside with their heads tucked under their wings where they're warm and snuggly. But what about, what about Minerva Louise? Is she doing that? No. What is she doing in that picture? She's running away for the snowy world. She, she likes the snow. Not Minerva Louise. She couldn't wait to go out exploring. Everything was so beautiful. She wanted to stay out all day, but it was too cold. If I had some warm things like you, she said, I could stay out and play. What about you? When it's snowy, do you like to stay inside or go out and play? I like staying outside. Yeah. I want to go all day long and even night. You want to play out in the snow all day and all night? Well, what do you need to do that? Can you just go out with your pajamas on? No. No? What do you need? Now, if you see, oops, oh, I, oh, I didn't want it to really stop. There's a, you can see the picture on the cover, which is the snowman that has, uh, it's all done up with uh, the things that you need to have, a hat and a coat uh, and a scarf and so forth, and that's gonna be important here in a second. Oh, darn it. Uh, I wanted to just pause. So you can see the, pic you see the picture there. That's what she's looked at inside the book there. Cold outside, it's all snowy. And they just want to stay inside with their heads tucked under their wings where they're warm and snuggly. But what about, what about Minerva Louise? Is she doing that? No. Not Minerva Louise. She couldn't wait to go out exploring. Everything was so beautiful. What about you? When it's snowy, do you like to stay inside or go out and play? And some boots and... Mm -hmm. Gloves. And gloves, yep. What about for the top of your head? A snow hat. You need a snow hat. Which I do have. Like That's what Minerva Louise says. She says, if I had some warm things like you, I could go out and play. I could stay out and play. So now she's going to look for some of those things. A scarf might help, but not this one. It's way too big. So she's standing in the middle of a garden hose at this point. Um, and talking about putting on a scarf. Um, oh, don't tell me. I hope that didn't go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. oh, Whenever you're ready. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pause it. Well, anyway, I'll just one more here. You'll get the sense of it. I could stay out and play. So now she's going to look for some of those things. Poor Minerva Louise. And these shoes are too big, too. Are those actually shoes? No. What are they? Gloves. They're gloves, and she's trying to put them on her feet. That's silly Minerva Louise. Okay, so that's how the story goes. So she finds one crazy thing after the next. A hat is actually a little, a little a, a barrel, bat, little uh, baskets. Um, she puts on gloves uh, for her feet, uh, and so she's by the end she's looking totally ridiculous, um, and she's going around outside. So just take a minute and talk about how uh, theory of mind plays into understanding the story. <clears throat> And how and what um, her mom is doing to help her with it.
Okay, I'm going to move along quickly now because I see the clock is, is getting away from me. Uh, two or three ideas. Do you guys have any, any thoughts here? Just, just we, we were kind of back on the, the theory of mind. We'd never heard, heard that before. Oh. And, and just that, that ability to, it, I would think it would kind of lead then into, into empathy mm -hmm. um, and having that reflection and understanding that, you know, the whole world, as a child, the whole world revolves around you, but there are other people in your universe, and these are the ways that, that they think and they react to, to situations. That's right, yes. The theory of mind in, depends kind of when you've had your developmental psychology. Uh, if you had it when, when Piaget was reigning supreme, you would have heard it in terms of egocentrism. Um, but, but theory of mind is something that's been studied really intensively since the 1990s. Um, and it's this, this growing capacity that really starts to make its uh, presence known around uh, three and four years old. Um, but it's, it's, it's actually uh, a capacity that continues hopefully develop for many years. Um, but yeah, and it does relate to empathy. Um, so I, I, thoughts about how um, the, Jana was helping with uh, dealing with that theory, the theory of mind issues here. Um, just that she was relating um, the child's perspective to the character and how those two perspectives might be different. So um, you would wear these things outside, but this particular character is wearing gloves on their feet, and that's different than you might do, but it's still okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That, that, I, that's, that sort of, you nailed it right there. And that, that's what's so beautiful about this is she really starts by setting up, you know, it's cold and what do you do? Um, and would you want to do that? And then, and then making explicit that, well, Minerva Louise thinks that that's going to be a scarf, but it's not really a scarf. And so it's being very explicit. Not all books provide such an obvious, um, I actually set this up because I wanted to have an example of theory of mind and I knew a good conversation would come out. But many stories um, are about why are characters doing this? Uh, and what does that character know that the other people don't? Because frequently the reader has to understand things that the characters don't understand. And if you don't get that, that miss, you're not going to really understand. So if one of the things that um, teachers are trying to do is to build higher level thinking, um, to build an inferential thinking. A lot of inferential thinking around narratives um, is around this issue of getting into the head of the other person, what they're feeling, what they're thinking, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, okay, so we've said most of these things. Um, so the, the important thing I want to emphasize here is that um, <clears throat> this is a very important capacity. It's developing in the preschool years. It continues um, up through the years. Um, and there are certain things we can do to, to f facilitate its development. Um, you can talk about uh, mental, well, use of mental state words. So words like think, wonder, uh, want, um, believe. Those are all words that refer to things that aren't out there in the world. It's not like labeling a glass and a cup. It's labeling a, a thing that doesn't exist except in your mind uh, and in your emotions. Um, and the children's development of those words that talk about those mental states um, is supportive of theory of mind development. Um, and so simply using those words more often is related to children's acquiring of, of theory of mind. Um, interestingly, um, syntactic development, children's grammatical development, also helps develop their, with their pushes their theory of mind because it so happens that mental state words are used in certain kinds of complement syntactic structures called complement structures. I wonder what, I believe that. Those are called comp complements. They're a little more sophisticated syntax than this sort of standard language. So the, the children developing grammatical sophistication may provide a, a, a starting point for this, maybe one reason that it doesn't begin to come in until children are three and four. Now, where do you have that kind of talk? Well, it could happen around the dinner table. It could happen when, when uh, child, one child is knocked over somebody else's tower and the teacher says, well, did he really mean to do that? How, how do you think you feel? And when, you, when you're problem solving, that's a rich opportunity. But book reading is a very uh, potent setting. And people have looked, been interested in theory of mind, find that there's, a, there's much more talk about mental states in, during book reading than other times of the day. So that's another one of these reasons that, that book reading is such a powerful um, capacity. And just as with attachment, um, language and, and, and executive functioning, um, or we already sort of a review here, language and executive functioning are related, begin, are related beginning at 14 months, and that, that continues. Um, and these are 
inter intertwined. So the development of, of language, um, executive functioning, and um, theory of mind all inter are interrelated and they, they have continued power, potency, to support development all the way through um, the schooling years. <clears throat> So language is, is, there's an intertwined development here, um, like, a, like a, an amazing braid that gains strength by the different strands being woven together. Um, one reinforces the other. Um, so these, and these are all flowing from language-rich interactions that happen, the most potent setting happening in intimate one-on-one -on -one interactions, but you can also have this kind of support in settings, group settings, um, where the teacher is providing language-rich experiences. Um, okay, so now to move on to, um, to reading, um, and reading comprehension in particular, um, because that's the, what we really want with uh, reading instruction is to get children understanding texts. Um, and so there's been, of course, many years trying to understand what gives rise to the capacity to understand text. Um, and there's something that's been developed really in the, in the 80s which still is uh, being reinforced and supported in varied ways, although it's, of course, being adjusted slightly. It's called the simple view of reading. And it's nice that it's simple because everybody can kind of, it makes real common sense. Uh, if you're going to understand a, a book, one thing you need to do is to be able to decode the print. So what early teachers spend a lot of time on is, you know, here's the letters, and the letters make these sounds, and the sounds turn into these words. And that's, that's decoding, take, to getting the print off the page into language. Um, but just turning print into words isn't enough, of course. You need to be able to put those words together into sentences and into meaningful constructs um, to make sense of them. So that's measured by the children's language comprehension. So you need to have strong, broad language skills um, to, to go with the, the ability to decode the print. And finally, there's a, um, that's the simple view that as it's been, been developed is this decoding and language comprehension is what it takes. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm adding a third element, which now research is, com is uh, consistently reinforcing, uh, is self-regulation. So all, all three of those are sort of a three-legged stool, um, and, and those, those, are, those are intertwined, um, decoding language um, and self-regulation. Now, um, so just to sort of go over how that, just to make it just a little more concrete. So here we have um, a little girl reading a book, um, sounding out the words, the dragon breathe fire. Okay, so she's getting the word dragon and breathe. Um, now, she's fortunate, been raised uh, in a world where she knows something about maybe um, knights and, and dragons and fairy tales and so forth. And so all the knowledge that she has about what happens in that imaginary world begins to be activated. <clears throat> And she draws, she puts the words together into sentences, and she builds what's called a mental model um, about this. Is and she reads, you know, uh, the dragon breathed fire onto the frightened dragon who ran away. So she she uses the, the the sounds, the letters, the knowledge that she has, and she puts it together in a whole sentence and and creates a, a model of what what's going on um, in that text by putting this all together. Now. Um, I was going to have you um, talk, let's just talk together. So if that's the way we think about reading um, and language, um, what are the implications for children who come to school who are sec dual language learners? Thinking about reading in, in this way, um, are there implications for um, how we address children who don't speak um, English? Suppose children come they have homes, they speak Vietnamese or whatever other sort of language. Um, what is that, what implications does that, have? how do you work with those children to, to support them? Any, any thoughts? Which, which, yeah, go ahead. So, the simple view of reading says that you have to have rich language skill and then they have to be able to decode print. So you need to figure out where their weakness is. So, so usually students that have, um, other ESL, they probably have str struggles with decoding print. So you need to focus more on that. Um, and they kind of equal each other out because then you can't have reading comprehension. So you might, for those students, work uh, heavily on decoding print um, and do explicit instruction in that and then kind of um, leave the language comprehension up. And sometimes you have kids that are missing both too. 
and that's when the, there's a real struggle. Okay, so um, certainly the decoding um, is a good area to start with, and it, it so happens that um, there's, at least between Spanish and English, where there's been a fair amount of study done, um, there's transfer between Spanish and English, so that, uh, Span so that Spanish ability to attend to sounds and Spanish phonological awareness transfers to English. Um, and letters, you know, Spanish is, a, if they happen to learn some, if they happen to learn reading in Spanish, the letters uh, translate pretty well. But certainly decoding um, is an important um, capacity, and that's a good starting point. That's where a lot of energy goes. What about the language part? So what do you, what, what do, you do about language? They don't necessarily speak English. So the, what about the background knowledge part? Any, any thoughts about work with second language learners? Yeah, here. Could you use pictures and make that, make that transfer between this is dr a gun, and then so the you word can dragon, here's a picture of a dragon, uh, to facilitate that background knowledge comprehension Right. Yeah, you, you, you can absolutely um, work to build background knowledge. And pictures, um, there was one story, uh, one study that was done, Rebecca Silverman um, added video uh, to first grade, second grade um, instruction. Um, and she found that the children who had these little video clips um, infused into their instruction did much better. So it was, you can build the, uh, the knowledge you may not have all the words for dragons and running and fighting and so forth, but, um, but the, or whatever the content might be. Um, but you can begin to build their knowledge through other, other means, um, and, and the knowledge will bring with it some language. Um, but interestingly, in that study that I'm referencing, um, the second language learning children benefited a lot from having the video clips. The native speakers didn't matter. I mean, it didn't hurt them. They had enjoyed seeing them. But, but it's, a, after, it's that filling that knowledge gap um, in ways that don't rely on what they're maybe weak with is their, their spoken language. <clears throat> so I spent um, a lot of time focusing on vocabulary, as have many others, um, because there's now uh, just pretty much overwhelming evidence that the size of a child's vocabulary um, is a very potent um, predictor of later success. So a um, number of studies have looked at children's vocabularies, the size of their vocabulary when they're three and four years old, and find that the size of vocabulary at that age is very predictive of third grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, all the way through high school. So that it's a very strong predictor um, of how you're going to be doing. Um, study that I did, we looked at kindergarten vocabulary and then looked at children in the end of seventh and eighth grade. Um, and if, if you know anything, it was like a, a correlation of a 50%, a 0.50 correlation. It's 25% like of the variability in reading comprehension in seventh and eighth grade could be predicted from children's uh, kindergarten vocabulary scores. Um, it's a, a very high level of predictiveness. Um, and all the way through 11th grade. So there's, there's no doubt that once kids get started on a vocabulary trajectory, and that trajectory actually has now been traced back to 18 months, 12 months, that um, it, it continues to have a momentum of its own. Um, and for second language learners, um, the knowledge of English <coughs> in the preschool years um, is a, a predictor when they enter school how much English they know. Of course, they're not going to—they're not going to be fluent. But if they even know a little bit of English, that puts them at advantage relative to children who come in completely cold with no no prior acquisition of of English. So um, <clears throat> I'm completely believe that we want to support um, children's use of native language at home. Um, but if, if you have classrooms where there's English language being instruction being delivered, um, that's a really important setting. You want to maximize the, ben the, the benefits of that because the entry level um, English capacity, children who come in with a, a start, this is assuming your elementary schools are in Engli are English environments. Uh, some settings they're du being dual language, and in those cases, children aren't at such a disadvantage. They actually, it's beneficial to have dual language. But if you don't have dual language instruction, uh, having some access to, to uh, English when they enter uh, is quite beneficial. Um, uh, okay, and then of course the ac access to vocabulary and language um, is 
correlated with, with social economic background and the parental education. There's a much, much, um, the children who come from parents who have less education are much more likely um, to enter school with the language vocabulary that they need and those differences that have started kindergarten widen uh, during the school years. Um, and this, the issues for second language learners that I mentioned, there's, there's the same kinds of concerns for second language learners. So what um, the, the message clear from research, the, the very clear message from research, um, is that we really want to invest early on um, in children's acquiring um, vocabulary because it pays dividends. Um, the, the early vocabulary that, that Eliza was building there as she was looking at that book um, is building her, la her capacity to learn language, is building not only, not only does it build her knowledge of vocabulary, it builds her ac ability to acquire new vocabulary I, in ways that I'm, I'm not going to go into here. But there's a there, this this a self perpetuating capacity um, to get to be good at learning language that that's that's fostered in these early years as children are are entering school. So what are some strategies that can be used um, for supporting language learning, um, both inside of classrooms and outside classrooms? Since we're thinking about the the whole child here, there are certain repeated. Um, pieces of inf uh, guidance, um, having sustained conversations. We saw um, Tanya and Jana both engaging in a sustained interaction with the child over time. Now, if you think about classrooms, how, long, how often is a teacher able to stay with a single child? Not often. I mean, the realities of classrooms is just not very easy. Um, but, but there is now research that shows that the, uh, the ability to engage in harmonious, sustained interactions is one of the real key um, engines that's driving early development. Um, a phrase that I've used many times is um, strive for five. And when I say strive for five, I don't know what it's going to There, it's right there. Okay, good that. I, <laughs> um, what I mean by that um, is to have uh, five back and forth ex exchanges. So I say, um, oh, what, um, what kind of animal is that? And the child answers. He says, oh, it's a doggy. And I, that's, so that's two. And then I say, oh, yeah, what, do you know, what, do we see a doggy yesterday? And the child says, oh, yeah, we saw, we saw um, Brownie uh, outside. And I say, yeah, that's right. What was Brownie doing? That's five. So back, back and forth. Now, a, a common pattern that happens for lots of reasons is a, is a teacher might say, oh, what kind of animal is that? The child says, dog. And the teacher says, that's right. And that's the end. Um, if, if you can get beyond the three to four and five, you're into the point where they're, you're building, uh, building a, an interaction that's responsive to the child, and you're having a back and forth uh, sort of engagement. So it, it's actually it's harder than you might think to have that, especially in a busy classroom, to have that many back and forth exchanges um, with a child. So ex sustained conversations, expanding children's knowledge. Um, I strongly encourage, in the preschool years and, and then beyond, um, curriculum that includes um, science, especially with young children, science is so concrete. Um, and when you get into the elementary school years, um, I think it's just critical that we don't spend all of our time hammering away on basic skills because the, the, actually the ability to read texts partly depends on, on vocabulary and it also depends on knowledge. If we don't have the knowledge of what you're reading about, um, you're going to have problems making sense of the, the things once you've read it. So, so that you can address that in school. If you're dealing with families, you can, you can in, encourage families to be aware of the local resources. One of the unfortunate things that happens often is that the, the most advantaged families are the ones that take most advantage of the resources in the community. They go to the library, they go to the zoo. Now, um, so, so other families may not, partly because they don't know where it is, they don't have access, um, they, and they're not unfamiliar with it. But I would encourage um, to find the zoos and, and these local um, community uh, cultural organizations are eager to encourage participation. There are cities that provide free entrance. Um, so if you are in a community, you might say, well, what are resources outside of school that can serve children, um, and how can we encourage those families to use those resources in a, a more consistent and effective manner? Uh, story times in, 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 in the, the, the uh, library. Um, even things have been done in grocery stores and museums. 
Um, of course, you've, you've heard, uh, and everyone sh hopefully has now heard that you should be reading, but not reading just occasionally, but reading every day. Um, and read different kinds of books, story books as well as informational books. Um, sometimes the people don't realize how much kids can enjoy a book, a beautiful book about birds that has all different kinds of birds in it and opportunities to talk about birds or bridges or machines or different kinds of things. Um, as I already mentioned, these other here. And then communicate the message to parents that books aren't just to read through. As you pointed out, uh, uh, Eliza didn't just read the book. Uh, but she, Liza had a, uh, Tanya had a conversation about that book as it was being read. Uh, and that's sometimes parents can um, get in the mode of, well, I'm supposed to read a book, so be, be quiet while I read you the book. But that, that's, that's defeating the purpose of the booker. And the booker needs to have an interaction that's supportive of the child. Um, and in, for, for classrooms, plan to teach language. Build, build activities that have intentional um, goals of language instruction. Um, and then try to have daily times um, for, for rich conversations. And I'm going to uh, see. What, all right, I'm, I want to. Um, I'm going to skip this question because I want to show you a little bit more. Uh, or a comment here about raising bilingual children. Um, of course, language is, is integral to culture. There's reason that families want to hold on to their home language. It's what, what, what links one generation to the next. It was what links one to one's cultural heritage, just as people, we had a St. Patrick's Day yesterday. Now, I don't know how many of those people were Irish, but a lot of them were enjoying at least being Irish or pretending to be Irish for a day. <laughs> I, I, last night, I was looking at an open table to try to find out where I wanted to go for dinner. So I found a place that looked like it'd be pretty good. And I walked in, oh my gosh, it was like jammed wall to wall with people wearing green and drinking beer. I thought, no, I, was, I, I found the wrong place. <laughs> uh, anyway, but, but, but we, people, we want to, of course, um, uh, continue the language that is a part of people's culture in their lives. But it's important that sometimes the parents of children who are uh, parents themselves don't speak English are desperate to have their children be successful in our society. Um, and they know that one of the biggest ways of, of being ensuring success is to have children gain English competence, something that they themselves don't have. Uh, and so there can be fear that, that if they actually use their home language as children, they'll confuse them. So if I'm going to speak my language, they'll, they'll make it harder for the child to learn English. And I really want them to learn English, even though I can't speak it. Well, one important message from developmental science is that children do not confuse two different languages. So if children are being exposed to two languages, you're not going to mix them up. Um, growth may be a little slower if they're acquiring two languages just because they've got a little bit more going on, but it's not suppressing them and you're at an advantage if you have two languages for a variety of reasons. Um, now, another very important finding, children do not learn English very well when a parent with really weak English tries to use it with them. So there can be incredibly well-meaning parents who try to make to do something with, with maybe their first language is Spanish, and they really want their child to learn English, and so they're going to persist on using what weak Spanish they have. It doesn't help the kids in their English acquisition. It does not benefit their English acquisition, and it, 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 it subverts their ability to learn Spanish, which the, which the parent can use because she's a fluent adult user of Spanish or whatever that other language might be. So it's a really important message. Um, now, it, if you do have a fluent speaker, if somebody who speaks English or somebody who speaks Spanish, children are an advantage if they have access to that other parent using English, say. So I'm not saying that, that it's a bad thing to have English using the home. But if the English model is a very poor model of English, um, you're better to stay within the home language where they're getting the kind of support that that, that parent can provide. Uh, I've already talked about the next point, um, and I think I've touched the, the, both of those points. Um, okay, and I, uh, okay, so just, you know, I think I'm going to skip over that. So when can you have rich conversations? Well, one of them is mealtimes, and mealtimes are something that happen in homes, but they also can happen if you have preschools. Um, Head Start, from the beginning of time, was supposed to have uh, family set and meal times. Um, can, there's reasons for that. Then one of them is that it's a good place for building relationships. It also can support children's language. Um, the study that I did with Catherine Snow, we followed children from preschool up into the middle grades. Um, and one of the things we did is we had parents record um, spontaneous meal times. Um, put the tape recorder and that we weren't around. They recorded the meal time and we transcribed it. <laughs> Not me, but graduate students uh, and others transcribed them. Um, and what we found was that the, the quality of language and especially the variety of words that children heard during those meal times when they were kindergarten 
were, were related to their fourth grade vocabulary, which was also related to children's comprehension. Um, so you know, I'm sure that's spam. Um, um, so the, 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 the richness, and some of those, the, the child might have been talking, the child might have just been participating in one of these wonderful interactions where parents are having conversations, maybe a friend has dropped by, a grandparent is there. The, the richness of those mealtime conversations that the child was a part of was a, a, was a predictor of development. Now, I've also done some work looking in classrooms, um, and in that same study, um, we found that the, the, the mealtime conversations in classrooms was predictive of children's acquisition of uh, vocabulary. I think I'm, um, so I'm gonna skip over this, but well, there's actually a study that we've just recently done um, is looking at, at the kinds of conversations that teachers tend to have in classrooms. And these are Head Start classrooms. Um, and some of these classrooms, uh, the teacher had what it was, they called, we call a social personal focus, whereas uh, how people are feeling at home, what's going on in home, which builds a relationship and has wonderful opportunities for talk. Another was a more sort of an academic focus. Well, we had vegetables today. Where did vegetables come from? What kind of vegetable is that? Sort of an academic-y kind of talk. Some teachers tend to engage in this kind of talk more. Some use that kind of talk more. Some spend a lot of time on manners and be careful and don't do this and this is what's healthy for you. Well, that's not very good uh, in terms of what the children's development is. I'm gonna skip this negative um, uh, finding. Be but what we found was that parents, the teachers who use sort of a mix of that social focus and the academic focus and had a richer mix of vocabulary that was getting used, those children made better growth in their receptive vocabulary scores during the course of the year. Just the teachers use that time to connect. So we have a measure of vocabulary. If we had a measure of relationship of the deepening of bonds between teachers and children, we might well have a nice significant finding there. Um, I wanna show you just a minute here of uh, what can happen when a teacher um, is attentive to children and picks up on the opportunity to have a sustained conversation. This is a Head Start teacher. Uh, just at the end of meal time, she's getting ready to leave. What's going Last on? night. You saw a raccoon? Up Last in the night? tree. Up in the tree. That's so funny because you know what? Last weekend when I went to New Hampshire, I saw a raccoon uh -huh. up in a tree. What did your raccoon do? It, it, it was moving. Wait, I want to hear about John's raccoon. You saw a raccoon last night. What was it doing, John? It, it was moving. It was moving? Can you show me it, how? Its eyes were open. Its eyes were open, so it was awake? Yeah. Can you show me how it was moving? Can you show us how it was moving? It was moving backwards. Moving no. backwards? Yeah. Did it? It didn't fall off the tree, though. No. No? And then what did it do after it was moving? Papa? It, it just came and it just walked, it just climbed right into the tree. Oh, it climbed inside the tree? Yeah. All right. I'm not going to have time for you to analyze that. And it's, it's amazing how much happens in that... 90 seconds. <clears throat> so, first of all, um, she started with saying, uh, you saw a raccoon last night, so she's following the child's lead with an open-ended question, sort of uh, opening it up. And then she makes a personal connection about, about the fact that she had seen a raccoon also building a relationship there. She didn't take over and tell her story. She stopped talking. You may have times when you wish that that would happen more often. Another open-ended question. Um, it was moving, it was moving, and then some kids started to try to interrupt. And Cindy said, wait, um, I want to hear about John's raccoon. So she focused on one child, she protected the conversation. I saw this teacher on a number of occasions. She, this was not an accident. She just did this relentlessly. I've seen her with talking to a child and somebody taps her on the shoulder and totally ignores the child because she creates a culture in which if I'm having a child conversation with you, that's what's happening. I'm not gonna get distracted by a bunch of other type conversations. And she basically told the others, invited the others to watch and the other kids began to tune in and participate in that little conversation. Um, she, sustain, she continues to sustain the, the topic of the conversation. Um, and now interestingly, um, so she, it was moving, so she, she asks an open-ended question 
that's a, for nonverbal response. And then Boyce says, it, it's, it was, its eyes was open, and then she does, she models uh, adult use. She says, were open, so there's a little grammar lesson right there. And she gives, was open, and then she gives the definition for what was happening, the, the, uh, the raccoon was awake. Um, she continues on that down here. Um, uh, what it did after it was, it was op she opened another open-ended question could, to sustain, she continued to sustain the topic in various ways. Uh, she did another vocabulary instruction. Oh, it climbed inside the tree. So I could go on with this. So in the, this, now she of course was not saying, well, I'm gonna teach vocabulary here, I'm gonna do that. She was listening. She was listening and responding and extending. And that's, that's the po and she's continuing a sustained conversation. So if a teacher has as a goal to engage in these kind of conversation and realizes these, there can be incredibly rich conversations that are, that are multiple teaching opportunities that occur in the course of a very brief interaction. So she's not only, she, she's stopping, she's, she's building a relationship, she's asking clarifying questions, um, and she's, she's subtly shaping that and supporting that child's development. So I'm gonna need to um, uh, skip over the last thing, but I want to um, also say that you can also, those are informal interactions. You can plan, conversa plan interactions that build children's opportunities for language. Um, Here's a, lemonade, a lesson making lemonade that was in the curriculum that we've used. And not only can you plan the lessons, but as supporters for teachers, you want them to recognize the potential for a lesson. This was a lesson that was given to teachers to make lemonade with children. One teacher took it literally as a cooking lesson. We're going to make lemonade. And this is a semantic web whoops, uh, that showed the, the, the words that got used as that teacher basically got through the lesson and they made lemonade. The kids got to drink lemonade. This is another teacher who the children got to drink lemonade, but she had a conversation about it as it went, talking about what the things were, talking about the processes, and engaging sustained conversations with children. The same lesson. So the message here is you can plan lessons that have a focus for learning, but you need to have teachers understanding that they're trying, that they're building content as they're doing these activities. It's not just to get through the activity. Um, and interestingly, though, that and I'm going to skip over that point. So um, a final little self-advertising here. What I've been talking about is uh, this notion that all of these, these kinds of developments uh, begin in the early years and, and, and take, uh, they, they flower in, in the later years. Um, that is uh, the message of this book that's just out. If you want to have flyers about it, there's a little 10% discount. Um, it's a book that's written with um, Psych 101, early childhood teachers um, in mind. And there are videos, I've just shown you those videos. These videos are linked to the, um, to the book to sort of illustrate the, the message of it. So sort of some basic final guiding principles. Teach with intentionality, know what you're doing. Reflect constantly, did I accomplish what I want? Did, did the children really learn from those activities? And believe passionately in the importance of your work. And one last, I like a little uh, bit of inspiration to go on with. <clears throat> I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. So I know you go out there day after day working with children, families, or administrators, wherever you are, uh, and I encourage you to continue doing what you can do. So thanks very much.